Hej og velkommen til, eller tilbage her til dagens pengetips, hvor jeg igen har besøg af økonomichefen. Det er januar, det er et nyt år, og øh, jeg skal altså have lidt hjælp til at finde ud af, hvordan jeg skal investere i 2022. Det er blandt andet derfor, du er med det her i dag, <laughs> men det er også derfor, at vi skal se på Grahams video. Here's my own plan throughout the next 12 months, that I believe should be able to withstand whatever happened. Graham Stephan var faktisk en af dem, der fik mig til at begynde at lave videoer på YouTube, og han har efterhånden rigtig mange millioner investeret i både aktier og kryptovalutaer og alternative investeringer som fede biler, uger med mere. Manual transmission Lamborghinis, a well-optioned SLS AMG or even a Toyota 7000 GT. I den her video der reagerer økonomichefen og jeg på hans seneste video, hvor han altså gennemgår hans investeringsplan for år 2022. I thought that it would be helpful to share exactly how I plan to invest throughout 2022, where the next big opportunities could be, and where the markets could move over these next 12 months. Den video, den er faktisk utrolig interessant. Der er meget, meget spækket med information i det, så hold tung lige munden, for det kan virkelig gå stærkt nogle gange, når det er Graham, der snakker. By doing that, you'll be much better positioned in the event the market goes down, or even if it goes up. Either way you win. Men der er virkelig meget god viden at hente også ud over inspirationen. The best thing that you could do is ignore the noise and keep buying as usual. Og han har lavet en meget markant ændring i sin investeringsstrategi siden sidste år. You can invest in cryptocurrency as a part of a responsible, well diversified portfolio. Vi har også lavet en lignende video over på økonomichefen, hvor vi reagerer på Andre Jig, en af de andre store finans YouTubers. Ja. Og hans investeringsstrategi. Så så for at give den her video et like og hoppe altså over på økonomichefens kanal, hvor vi også reagerer på Andre Jigs investeringsplan. Der er link her under videoen. And when the crash is finally gonna come down, my honest answer. Tusind dollars om dagen, indtil videre. Okay. Måden det bare er en thumbnail, eller <laughs> måden det er det, han investerer. Jeg vil egentlig tro, han investerer flere penge. Jeg tænker også, fordi 365.000 dollars på et år. Det er ikke så meget, hvis man tjener 5 millioner dollars på YouTube. Præcis. Lad os prøve at se, hvad han investerer i. Om der er noget, vi kan lære fra det. What's up guys, it's Graham here. So for a lot of us, 2022 is probably going to be one of the most confusing years of investing. After all, with interest rates beginning to increase, there's the concern that stocks might begin to decline. Real estate investing is an option, but home price growth has begun to decelerate now that the Fed is tapering their mortgage bond buying. And with the stock market, yeah, it's easy to buy in, but how could you be sure it's the right time, especially when the market's already up 45% in the last two years? Well, given all of that uncertainty, I thought that it would be helpful to share exactly how I i plan to invest throughout 2022, where the next big opportunities could be, and where the markets could move over these next 12 months. Into Shiba Elon. Just kidding. Although real talk, before we start, I want to sincerely thank everybody who subscribes, hits the like button, or comments down below for the YouTube algorithm. It helps out the entire channel tremendously. Jeg tror billedet, det var hans editor. Ja, ja, skal ja. Så det er editoren, han har siddet på YouTube og editeret den ind. Men hold op, han snakker hurtigt i forhold til Andre. Ja, det gør han. Det gør virkelig stærkt. All right, so what makes this year so interesting is that we're dealing with some rather unprecedented headwinds that haven't exactly existed before now. Of course, sure, in the past, we've seen excess inflation and stagnation throughout the 1970s. We've seen a sudden interest rate spike in the 1980s that caused a brief stock market sell-off, and we've seen what happens during a prolonged shutdown in 2020. But now it's come time that we have to deal with the repercussions of consistently putting off the inevitable. And that would be removing stimulus, raising rates, and preventing consumer prices from rising even higher. That added this really confusing layer on top of everything else, because even though the last two years have heavily favored the investor, things just don't move up consistently without a few bumps along the way. So given how we're near record highs, while the market begins to panic on the whims of interest rates, here's my own plan throughout the next 12 months that I believe should be able to withstand whatever happens. So I think it's a really good point that he said that the market is still really, really much more end de sådan historisk set har gjort i gennemsnit, hvor det jo plejer at være, de har omkring 7% per år, så siger han 47% på to år. Og så giver det jo også meget god mening, at sådan noget kan jo ikke blive ved. Så man bør også på en eller anden måde forvente, at hvis der har været exceptionelt høje stigninger, så, så bliver det også nødt til at lave nogle korrektioner tilbage mod noget, der minder mere om et gennemsnit. Ja. Eller det er ikke nødt til det, men det er i hvert fald bare ret sandsynligt, at, øh, at man vil se nogle fald på et eller andet tidspunkt. Jeg tror, der er rigtig mange, der hurtigt kan... Man har sådan en tendens til bare at ekstrapolere. Altså sådan i sit hoved, så tænker man, at den udvikling, der har været, vil fortsætte. Yeah. Men det er meget usandsynligt, når den udvikling har været så langt væk fra det, man normalt ser. Så det er i hvert fald også noget, jeg tit oplever ved investorer. Der er sådan, okay, nu øh, for eksempel Nordisk, nu er den sted med 50 procent. 
og så kan det være, at den lige falder 10 procent, og så går folk i panik, men den er stadigvæk ja. stedet helt vildt meget, og sådan er det bare generelt på aktiemarkedet. Når noget er stedet meget, også det generelle marked, jamen så vil der også være nogle tilbagegange. Det er en helt naturlig del af det. Så du kan jo prøve at spørge dig selv, hvad vil du helst have? Vil du helst tage 10 kroner gratis hvert eneste år resten af dit liv? Eller vil du hellere have 100 kroner hvert andet år gratis, og så minus 50 kroner hvert andet år gratis? Du kunne tænke over, skriv det svar i kommentarfeltet. Hvad vil du helst, og så skriv det hernede. First, let's start off with the stock market. Throughout the last two years, without exaggeration, I invested pretty much everything that I had into about three dozen individual stocks, an S&P 500 index fund, and a total stock market index fund by Charles Schwab. All in all, since I dollar cost average into the markets on a regular basis, I made a year over year return last year of about 22%, which for me capitalizes on the momentum of the market without perfectly trying to time the peaks and lows. However, buying into- So let the same as we just saw from the Jigs video we saw for the other af vores kanaler, investere løbende dollar cost averaging, så mm. den i markedet konsistent hver dag eller hver måned frem for at prøve at time markedet. Og det gør så, at han netop, som han siger, han får et afkast, der afspejler nogenlunde markedsudviklingen hverken mere eller mindre. Ja. Han følger simpelthen bare med, hvad markedet gør. Nu han svar 22%, hvilket selvfølgelig er lavere end mm. S&P 500. Vi også så en anden video, der stiger med 27%, men det er også fordi alle pengene har jo ikke været investeret hele året, fordi det løbende kommer ind. Ja. Men så er man altså bedre både på opturene, men også på nedturene. Index funds was also very much strategic because I made a very conscious plan to diversify my portfolio as much as possible. And really up until now, I had too much of my money invested in real estate. I know that sounds kind of crazy to say. But seriously, two years ago, I had almost 100% of my net worth tied up between seven properties in Los Angeles. And it got to a point where I realized that wasn't smart. I began to realize that beyond a certain point, it becomes more important to diversify into other areas. So that way, if something happens to one, you have something else to fall back on. So I set out on a goal to have as much invested in the stock market as I do in real estate. And I'm really proud to say that as of a few months ago, I hit that milestone. That means for the rest of 2022, I'm still going to be investing in index funds, although it'll be slightly less than I have in the past at roughly 30% of my income. But as far as my thoughts about where the markets might be headed over the next year and when the crash is finally going to come down, my honest answer is I have no clue and nobody knows. So Hans Jihad, he invested 30% of his income i indeksfondene. Og det er lidt mindre, end han har gjort hed til, fordi han har forsøgt at prøve at få sin øh, aktieportefølje op til speed med sin ejendomsportefølje, så han ikke har en alt for stor vækning i en en aktieklasse. Ja. Og der er han så nået til nu, så nu har skruer han lidt ned for det igen, men, men jeg synes stadigvæk, det er meget fedt at høre det konkrete tal. 30 procent, altså det er jo, det er jo svært med, med en normal løn, kan man sige, i Danmark at investere 30 procent af sine penge hver måned i aktier. Men man kan jo måske prøve at starte med 10 procent, og så lige så stille mm. arbejde det op ja. øhm, i takt med, at man forhåbentlig kommer til at tjene måske flere penge i løbet af sit liv. Eller hvis ikke man gør det, så kan man forsøge at skære ned på nogle omkostninger, så man måske mm. kan investere noget mere. Men Great. jeg synes i hvert fald, at de her 10 procent er golden at, øh, at sætte af til aktier. Ja. Det er det, man har fra klassikeren. Hvad hedder den, den der gamle bog der med Babylon? No, the richest man in Babylon. Ja, lige præcis. Han sagde, at mindst 10 procent skulle man betale til sig selv hver måned. Så ligesom betale sig selv først, mm. sæt af, det er et rigtig godt sted at starte. Og så jo flere penge du tjener, jo mere vil du også procent ved at kunne sætte af, så frem din forbrug ikke øges tilsvarende selvfølgelig. It's still unclear how much the Fed is going to be tapering their stimulus, when interest rates will increase, how the markets will react, and if supply chains will begin easing up. There's so many variables that could change on a daily basis, and giving any sort of accurate answer is really just a guess at best. It'll keep going up until you've invested all of your money, and then it'll keep going higher, or it'll keep dropping until you've run out of anything to invest, and then it'll drop even further. So given that, as long as you have an investment time frame of at least 10 years, the best thing that you could do is ignore the noise and keep buying as usual. The truth is, sometimes the simplest approach is also the most effective, and in this case, a 20-year holding period has never once produced a negative result. Although, let's rewind for a second, because you might have... Så altså det, han lige viser her, fordi det går også meget hurtigt, mm. det er, at uanset hvornår man startede i... Lad os lige prøve at se, hvad det her det er. Det er så fra 1926 til 1995. Jamen så, så længe du har holdt din aktier i her det amerikanske SP 500 index i mindst 20 år, så du faktisk altid har haft et positivt afkast mm. på mellem, hvad er det laveste, omkring 2% om året, op til omkring 15, 16, 17% procent 
om året. Og Gud ham giver generelt nogle rigtig gode og fornuftige råd her, og selvom han er multi-multimillionær, så er det dejligt at høre, at han faktisk følger det, som for eksempel vi også gør. Investerer mm. fast hver måned, investerer primært i passive indeksfonde, investerer langsigtet, ignorerer støjen. Det er altså regler, der gælder for mere eller mindre alle, der gerne vil tjene penge langsigtet på aktiemarkedet. Og man kan sige, at der er selvfølgelig ingen garanti for, at det her det vil fortsætte ud i fremtiden. For eksempel så har det japanske aktiemarked haft en 20-årig periode, hvor det fuldstændig flatlinede, hvor man ja. ikke tjente nogen penge der. Så det er ikke fordi, det er umuligt for aktier at stå stille i 20 år, men Nej. vi har bare endnu ikke set det på det vestlige aktiemarked. Vi kan simpelthen se helt tilbage fra 1926, man har bare tjent penge i ups and downs. Og altså 1926, der var altså et tidspunkt, hvor der var 2. verdenskrig og alt muligt, så mm. det siger alligevel lidt. Although let's rewind for a second, because you might have already noticed that I'm only investing 30% of my money in index funds this year. So where's the rest of it going, you might ask? And that would be real estate. See, like I mentioned, prior to 2020, real estate was pretty much my only investment. I would work full time as a real estate agent, save my commissions, and then after months or even years of searching, I'd buy a worn down property, fix it up, and eventually rent it out. This is how I was able to accumulate seven properties throughout Los Angeles over 10 years. And even though it was a lot of work, I really enjoyed it. However, after a certain point, I realized it wasn't smart to be 100% invested in one asset class in one location. So for that reason, I made the conscious effort to divert my attention into other areas until I was properly diversified. And now that I've hit that milestone, I'm planning to go back into real estate where I could allocate about 50% of my money. Now on the surface, it seems almost unanimous among experts that how- So indtil videre, 30% i aktier og 50% i ejendommen. Så er der 20% tilbage. Ja, det tror jeg, at det var i hvert fald det, han havde nået. Så det ville mm. være 14 millioner dollars, ja. han havde. Det er mange penge. Det er dollars jo. Det må man sige. Prices will continue to rise throughout 2022, although at a slightly slower rate. CoreLogic, for example, expects housing prices to see a 6% increase throughout the next 12 months. Realtor.com predicts another 2.9% rise, and Zillow says that supply chain bottlenecks and years of underbuilding will keep inventory relatively low for the foreseeable future. But now that interest rates are expected to increase, I believe we could start to see a little bit more selling pressure, prices could begin to stabilize, and for the first time in years, it might be possible to buy the right deal at the The right price. I've really missed those projects and I believe real estate could be a fantastic way to leverage your money, build your wealth and make a positive difference by turning something from this into this. Og det er netop en rigtig god pointe det her med leveraging. Det er det, er det her koncept med gearing. med gearing, hvor man hvis man investerer i aktier, så som udgangspunkt så ejer man bare de aktier man køber for. Man kan også gear med aktier, men øh, det har nogle, nogle ulemper som ejendommen ikke har. Men i ejendommen, der giver du automatisk, medmindre du køber en ejendom kontant, så er der jo det her med, at du kan låne en eller anden vis procentdel af ejendomsværdi ja. øh, til en relativt lav rente. Og, og det gør simpelthen bare, at dine penge kan blive til flere penge hurtigere, fordi ja. du også tjener øh, afkast på de lånte penge. Ja. Så et kort eksempel. Tidt så vil man fx måske lægge 20% af sin bolig værdi. Så for 200 kroner, der kan man få adgang til et aktiv, der måske er 1000 kroner værd. Hvis dit aktiv så stiger med 10%, jamen, eller med 20%, kunne vi sige, jamen så 1000, 20% er 20, uh, 1000 kroner. Det vil svare til, at det stiger med 200 kroner. Men det er jo faktisk 100% af din investering her i det her tilfælde. Så man får ligesom rådighed over aktiver, der er mere værd for mindre penge ved at give ens penge. Og det kan man gøre både med boliger og aktier, men det er meget typisk ja, med boliger. In terms of everyone watching, as far as what I think is going to happen, personally, I wouldn't be surprised if the market begins to soften once the Federal Reserve raises rates, but I don't think that would crash the market. There's really so many other factors at play that will influence a property's value from the local market conditions, supply and demand, to and replacement cost. So even if one or two of those deteriorates, the others should more than help stabilize the value. Not to mention, since I buy these properties with the intention of renting them out, the value in between now and the next 15 years doesn't make a huge difference. So anytime you buy something with the plan to hold it long term, you become insulated from the short term movements in price. As far as my own advice for everybody watching, number one, always wait to find the right deal. I would never advocate rushing in to buy something because interest rates are still low or because you want to get something as soon as possible. It's so much more important not to get carried away and only pull the trigger when the numbers work, there's enough upside and it's in the right area. The second, you should only buy something if you plan to hold it for at least five to eight years. The reality is, Is anything can happen in the short term and as 2020 has shown us nothing is impossible holding on to your property for at least five to eight years is going to ensure that you'll be able to ride through any fluctuations in price even if the market ends up going down get us faxer 
ja. andre investeringer. Jeg vil så dog sige, at 5-8 years, det er måske lige kort nok. Jeg synes, jeg har hørt, at ejendomsmarkedet sagtens kan bevæge sig i 18 års cykler. 5-8 years, jeg, jeg tror sagtens, man også ville kunne være uheldig der. Men der er selvfølgelig noget med, hvis man har rental properties, ja, det, så tjener man også lejeindtægt. Det er også det, han siger, at han er lidt mindre, ja, han gør ikke så meget op i præcis, hvad prisen er i Ej. forhold til, når han køber og sælger. Han, så tror jeg, han nævnte, at 15 år var hans tid så sådan ja. mindst. Fordi han får jo også en øh, altså cashflow, det er også det, kommer til nu, kan vi mm. se. Han har jo et løbende cashflow, der gerne skulle dække de udgifter, han har ved at have boligen. Ja, så det er bare sådan vigtigt, at man ikke tænker på den her måde med den bolig, man selv bor i. Ja. Fordi der har du ikke nogen lejeindtægt, der er ja. det, der selv, der betaler af ja. ved at bo der. In investments, the value of the property should always come second to cash flow. Of course, it's always fun to look at your home's value online and see that number grow each and every year, but that number is somewhat meaningless unless you plan to sell or refinance. So instead, you should focus right now on the bottom line, and that would be cash flow. And finally, we have the other category, which makes up the remaining 20%, and that would be a combination of cash... No, I should just say crypto. Yeah. I mean, cash, crypto, or other. Cryptocurrency and other random collectibles that somehow have managed to outperform the S&P 500. But listen, before we go into that for a while now. All right, so in terms of my other investments, let's start off with cryptocurrency at 8%. Now, some of you know. Men tror du egentlig har alternative investeringer, så der er krypto. Jeg tænker også der er noget Pokémon kort. Der er helt sikkert noget Pokémon kort, og så tror jeg også bare, fordi NFT'er er blevet så sindssygt hyped, så tror jeg der må være et fokus på NFT'er og noget metaverse relateret. Og måske kunne der også være noget bil. Han har jo en Ford GT, mm. kan man se, det holder i baggrunden. Han ja. har også tidligere købt flere Lotus'er. Ja. Øhm, og jeg ved, at han har snakket meget omkring, at han elsker biler. Det kan også være, at han skulle købe en eller anden klassisk. Jeg så faktisk sådan en, en graf. Det er noget med, at biler var stedet 37 procent ja. det seneste år. Ja. Hvilket outperformer S&P 500. Ja. Øhm, så det er jo helt vildt. Det var jeg meget chokeret over. Ja, <laughs> det er vildt. Beginning of 2021, I made the choice to allocate 1% of my entire portfolio into a 60-40 split between Bitcoin and Ethereum. And I have to say, the more I researched and learned about cryptocurrency, the more comfortable I felt increasing that amount over time. Like throughout the last year, I've been buying both Bitcoin and Ethereum on a consistent basis, regardless of where it trades. And as a result, my allocation has increased. For instance, what started off as 1% quickly became 2%, which became 3 which became 5 and then 6 and now my goal is to have 8% cryptocurrency by the end of the year split evenly between Bitcoin and Ethereum. Not to mention, what I found very interesting is that studies show that you don't have to hold a large amount of Bitcoin in your portfolio to see a positive difference. In fact, Fidelity found that just a 5% allocation to Bitcoin would have boosted the cumulative return of a traditional portfolio by 65% since 2014, even despite the sell-offs along the way. On top of that, a New York investment firm even posted their findings that their best performing portfolio contained 3% Bitcoin and that boosted their account's value by 50%. So when it comes to this, it's very evident that a little bit goes a long way. That's why I've taken the stance that you can invest in cryptocurrency as a part of a responsible, well-diversified portfolio. But only invest a small amount relative to the rest of your account, stick with the largest cryptocurrencies out there that have a proven track record, only buy with the intention of holding long-term, and that should give you the best chance at making money. Next, we have cash. Det er nogle gode tips generelt. Mm-hmm. Også bare lige kort, kryptolus er meget mere volatilt, og svinger meget med værdi, har meget højere risiko end, øh, end aktier. Jeg tror også selv, jeg har cirka mellem 6-8% i krypto. Jeg vil helt sikkert ikke have det over 10. Ja, jeg vil sige, det, det er jo meget forskelligt, afhængigt af hvilken linse man ser det igennem. Fordi der er også, man kan sige, der er også argumenter for, at bitcoin kan være et alternativ til guld. Mm. Og på den måde, så kan man måske argumentere for, at det sagtens kan give mening at have mere end de her 8% i bitcoin, fordi aktiemarkedet netop kan risikere at blive trukket væk fra sine fundamentaler. Altså hvis, hvis der bliver puttet for mange penge ind i aktier, fordi folk ikke ellers ved, hvad de skal gøre med deres penge, så bliver aktiepriserne måske irrationelt høje i forhold til, hvor meget virksomheden egentlig tjener. Så jeg synes i hvert fald ikke, at det er helt simpelt at give et konkret tal. Jeg tror mere, man skal finde ud af sig selv, hvor hvad man er komfortabel med, fordi man skal nok forvente, at den del, man har lokeret i krypto, den kommer til at svinge rigtig meget. Mm. Så derfor øh, skal man nok vælge en procentdel, hvor man, hvor man har det fint med at se det falde måske 50% på en måned. Det, det har vi jo basically set ske yeah. her for nyligt med bitcoin. Så det er træls, hvis man har 80% af sin portefølje i krypto. Ja. Se sådan nogle tal. Så vil det nu så falde med 40%, hvor hvis du har 10% i krypto, så vil det så være 5%. I fælder. 
cash. To me, this is really a safety net in case something were to happen. You need cash immediately, and you can't call JG Wentworth 877 Cash Now. Those commercials are way too catchy. Anyway, I've always kept enough cash on hand to be able to cover one to two years of living expenses, provide a big enough buffer in the event an opportunity were to come up, and of course to pay for taxes because that's not automatically deducted. Now for me, I try not to keep too much cash on hand because otherwise that would be a wasted opportunity, but there is also something to be said about the peace of mind it gives me just to be able to have a little bit of extra cash on hand. So even though I don't optimize this one perfectly, it does have a psychological impact to be able to have something to fall back on just in case. Jeg vil sige en til to år, det er måske lidt voldsomt for de fleste ja. at have så meget. Øhm. Især i Danmark med det system, vi har her. Ja, man skal huske, at han investerer også i ejendommen, og der er også en værdi i at have nogle kapital klar til at slå til, som han siger, når, når mm. den rigtige deal er der, ja. så, så er det godt at have nogle penge fri til at gøre det med. Og som han også siger, han skal betale skat, og med de her indtægter, han arbejder med, så ville det være træls hele tiden at skulle sælge ud af sine investeringer for at kunne betale skat. Der er det lidt smartere at have penge nok eller kontanter nok til at kunne foretage alle skattebetalingerne uden at skulle til at spekulere i hvad der lige skal sælges. Ja. Det også leaves me with the opportunity to invest in startups, which is something I've really enjoyed doing over the last two years. To date, I've invested in eight companies, including two that I've done with partners, including BankrollCoffee.com and the Hungry Bull app that I'll link down below in the description. That's meant to be a daily newsletter where you could track all of your favorite stocks, see all the earnings reports in one place, and over time we plan to build it. And that's never blue, so I'm Leon Sule us. Yeah, you can see. Out even further. So if you want to be a part of it, the link is down below in the description. I've. Tror du, han er interesseret i at investere i discgolf? Du kan prøve at skrive en kommentar. Also invested in the free stock trading app Public, where of course if you want a free stock worth all the way up to $1,000, you can use that link down below in the description and use the code Graham. And when it comes to this, it's also really important that I only invest in companies that I like and use myself. That way I could have a better grasp in terms of how they might do in relation to everything else. Now with this, since startup investing is risky, I've basically taken the mental approach that once I invest my money, it's gone forever. I mean, if something happens, great, but otherwise I've already mentally burned the money to the ground. My understanding is that most angel investors throw money at 20 to 25 different companies with the expectation that maybe one or two will actually pan out. So even though I'm fairly optimistic on everything I've done so far, I'm not naive to think that they're all going to turn into multi-billion dollar buyouts. So we'll see what happens. And finally, there's the other category. I thought this is kind of funny, but a year ago I said this. And part of me would really love to invest in something like a Ford GT, for instance, which the lately color. has been climbing up in value. But we'll see on that, no promises. And yep, I ended up getting the car and now it's worth about 25% more than what I paid for it. Now obviously I'm not sure I could justify buying another car since I don't drive anywhere, but I'm not opposed to it if the right deal were to come up. And I could certainly see collectible cars becoming a lot more valuable over the next decade like manual transmission Lamborghinis, a well-optioned SLS AMG, or even a Toyota 7000 GT one day. Though I think this other category could also include fine art and watches, but I'll be honest, the market for those is absolutely ridiculous over the last year, so I'm not sure if that's ever going to happen, but I'll never say never. So overall, practically, here's where I'm going to be investing throughout 2022. First, I'm planning to dial back my index fund investing to about 30% of my income. I've already hit my target allocation between stocks and real estate, so from here on out, I'm only going to be investing enough into the S&P 500 just to be able to ride up the market over time and continue to build up my position. Second, I'm going to invest about 50% of my money this year in real estate. Like I mentioned, I think there's a lot of potential here for the right properties, and I would love to get back to documenting the process here on the channel like I used to in the good old days before COVID. And third, I'm keeping the remaining 20% split between cash, cryptocurrency, and alternative investments. Besides cash, most of this is going to be high risk, high reward. So that is my investment plan for 2022, and my biggest takeaway here is to always keep an emergency fund, invest consistently, and divert Diversify your investments so that you're not just dependent on one asset at one time. By doing that, you'll be much better positioned in the event the market goes down or even if it goes up. Either way, you win. And most importantly, do not panic sell even if the markets continue to go down like they somewhat have been. Study after study shows that the people who do the best have the patience just to keep buying and hodling and subscribing if you haven't done that already. Yeah, so a little more concrete than Andres, I would say, with the opdelings. Nogle ting, du blev overrasket over? Jeg vidste faktisk godt, at han investerede i uger. Det havde jeg bare glemt. Ja. Det, det, det talte han lidt om til sidst. Ja. Og så synes, så, så synes jeg, det er fedt det her med, at 
nu er han next level rig, altså nu, han, nu begynder han at være angel investor og mm. investere i startups og, ja. og sådan noget. Det er ligesom next step. Det, det jeg måske er lidt overrasket over, det er fordelingen, for jeg synes, jeg synes det at allokere 20% til cash og alternative investments, det synes jeg er sindssygt meget. Ja, men der var jo så også 8% krypto. Det, det er rigtigt. Sådan, det er han vil have 8% i krypto i hvert fald, så en stor del af det er krypto. Ja, og så det er egentlig kun 12%, der er fordelt ud over de der ja. ekstra ting ja. og, og kontanter. Ja, det, er måske egentlig, det giver måske egentlig meget fin mening. Men det er stadigvæk mange penge for ham i forhold til hans indkomst. Ja. Lad os sige, at han tjener ikke, mange millioner dollars på et år, ja. så det, det er flere millioner kroner, han har stående i kontanter og sådan. Men Igen, hvis han skal være klar til at købe... Okay, han har selvfølgelig budgetteret 50% til real estate. Ja. Så det må egentlig også bare stå i kontanter, indtil han altså ser en ja, deal. Ja, han rent faktisk køber noget. Ja. Altså han må have nogle perioder, hvor der virkelig er mange kontanter. Det må der være. Men jeg ja, ellers øh, rigtig god video. Øh, generelt en, øh, en fornuftig type. Masser af fornuftige gode råd. Investere langsigtet, investere konsistent, spred din risiko. Og Graham kan man sige, hvis du er ny, eller du ikke har masser af millioner ligesom Graham, Jamen så bekymrer dig ikke om, at du skal investere i alle de her forskellige ting. Man kan sagtens starte med en aktiv klasse, f.eks. aktier. Mm. Måske bevæge sig over i krypto på sigt. Måske bevæge sig over i alternative investeringer. Ejendomsmarkedet kræver generelt lidt mere kapital, hvis du bare ejer noget 100%. Men alternativt kan man overveje sådan noget som crowdlending eller forskellige sider, hvor man kan købe mindre andel i ejendommen. Ja, der er f.eks. de her REITs, som er ja. fonde, der minder rigtig meget om aktiefonde. Hvor du i stedet for at købe en hel ejendom, så køber du bare andel i fonden, og så ejer du små andel i mange ejendomme. Mm. Og der er ikke helt de samme fordele med, at man kan give med realkreditlån og sådan noget på, på samme måde. Men til gengæld så udbetaler de et relativt højt udbytte, fordi der er sådan en regel om, de skal udbetale 90% af deres overskud som udbytte til investorerne. Ja. Så det er i hvert fald, man kan sige, det er en lidt mere low entry level måde at komme til at investere i ejendom, hvis man er interesseret i det. Ja. Øh, uden at have en masse øh, millioner. Og så er der vist ikke andet tilbage end at sige, at øh, hvis du har nyt den her video, så giv den et like, og sørg for at gå over på den anden af vores kanaler, der er linket herunder, hvor vi altså også har set på Andrew Jick, en anden stor amerikansk youtuber, og hans investeringsplan for 2022. Tak fordi du kiggede med. Vi ses på internettet.